Got it. Go. Okay. Setting up. Boop, boop, boop. One minute. It's, it's still moving. There you go. All right. I can do it. Right. I can go now. Yeah. Okay. Once again, welcome to everyone. To um, let's meet up and talk three. I am um, happy that you accepted my invitation to participate in this uh, project. I think it's a pretty good thing to give some information about finances and business and so forth, um, especially uh, to our, our kind that I think uh, needs a lot of that type of information. So we will get started by asking uh, Estella Knights to do an opening prayer for us. Okay, thank you and welcome. Good night, everyone. We are here and we are going to give God praise and thanks for this opportunity that he gave us to be able to come and discuss about the finances. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this morning. We give you thanks and praise for your continual blessing over us. Father, this evening, Lord, as we will be here talking about finances, we pray and ask of thee that you be in the midst of the discussion tonight and that you will lighten the minds of those who are the panelists that will speak to us today in regards to our finances. Father God, we ask of thee to take charge of this show and I put my brother Francisco Knights in your hands right now as he would host this program tonight that you would use him to your honor and glory each panelist that you will likewise use them to your honor and glory i pray and answer thee that when we are done tonight that the mind of those who are part of this program will be able to observe and to be able to apply to make their lives better in jesus name amen amen well once again uh thank you all um, I think I will give a little explanation of, of uh, my reason for inviting the three persons that are part of our panel. Uh, I'll start with uh, my friend, Dr. Louisa Humes, whom I uh, met quite a few years ago in Boston uh, when she took my compadre away from me and took him to Florida. But um, we've had a very, very good uh, relationship. And uh, she's always, just like her husband, has always been there for us uh, when we need, whether it's advice or for anything. You know, and we, we always communicate, even though we're not uh, close to each other. Uh, Bishop Orlean Cummings, I don't really know but I feel like I do. I met her through my sister and the programs that I'm running with the uh, diaper donations and through communication with my sister, her organization was able to send us uh, a lot of stuff that we needed as far as diapers and uh, baby needs and so forth. And she shipped a barrel for us from New Jersey so through that, we have become uh, friends and communicators. I do um, want to say that one of the things that I admire about her, based on my little knowledge, is that what I seem to know that she uh, does and seem to be very busy, there's not a time that I've ever called her and she doesn't pick up the phone and always has a pleasant voice, like there's no business in her life. So I do appreciate and admire that. And thank you for participating. Mr. Uh, Isaac Villaverde, a chef and owner of La Tapa del Coco restaurant in San Francisco. And now he says he has a, a second one in, uh, where is it again, Isaac? Coronado, Coronado, Panama. and um, in, in the Republic of Panama. And I met him uh, on a TV program during the uh, Black, Black Ethnic Month in Panama, which is in May. 
and I was there to do a presentation about a program and he was there doing a presentation about food and that's how I met him. And we sort of became uh, friends and we did a program together um, before the pandemic time where at his restaurant, he honored, he asked me to pick, uh, I think it was seven people that um, I felt did good work in the community. And he honored them by providing them, I think it was a six or seven course meal. And he did a very good presentation, explained everything, how it was cooked and so forth. And um, the, the, the people that I selected, which some of them were surprised that I selected them, but it was people that I had known and I've watched over the years doing different uh, work in the community. They were very shocked and surprised and they, they really enjoyed the moment. Unfortunately, the pandemic came along and we weren't able to do it uh, for 2019. But I hope it's something that um, he still plans to continue doing in the future. Uh, so again, thank you all. And I'm going to um, open by um, selecting uh, Mr. Villaverde. And I'll give a short uh, introduction of Mr. Villaverde. Isaac Villaverde, a graduate of Fermín Nedo and Universidad Latina, is a chef and multidisciplinary entrepreneur. Isaac was born and raised in Panama City and since very young showed an outstanding capacity to communicate and support his points of view. He grew up within his family's restaurant and as, <clears throat> as an adult started his own food related business a restaurant known as La Tapa del Coco. Isaac has an MBA and several years of experience in logistic, project management, digital marketing, uh, strategic, man uh, strategic management. He's a full-time chef promoting Afro-Panamanian food and culture around the world. I present to you, Mr. Isaac Villaverde. Um. Thanks for the in introduction, Francisco. My, it's my pleasure to, to share some time with you guys um, as part of the Afro community. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, part of what we do is honor the, the elders and their, you know, their path, you know, and, and what, what the elders have done for, for the youth and for, for my generation, basically. And sometimes, unfortunately, um, we're kind of disconnected, like one generation to the other, uh, because we, we, we speak different languages, you know? Even though we, we communicate in the same, the same language, but the, the stuff that we, we speak about changes uh, with the years. So what we try is to honor and, and demonstrate that, that respect for the elders through what we do, so the youth can see Hey, La Tapa del Coco is doing this with the elders and, and you know, make them part of what we do. Um, we have taken the Afro-Panamanian gastronomy and, and we have tried to make it um, a competitor of, of the big scene in Panama City. Panama City, you can find um, Chinese food, Italian food, Greek food, you know, you can find French food. Um, now Japanese, you can find all of those in the city, but when it comes to our heritage, to our food, it's, it's, you can barely find, you know, like seven in the morning on a Sunday, a place where you can have a, a warm beef patty and a saril juice, you know what I mean? And so that has become my, my flag, my mission, my, my, my bottle of life. Like I, I'm pushing our generation to to understand that this is this is our culture and that if you do it right, you can make a living out of it. You can support your community. You can raise your kids, have your family and, you know, contribute to, to the society in a good way. Yes, you can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, you can be a professor. We need all of those. You know, we need, we need, we need to be multidisciplinary as a, as a community. But also our culture needs to be, you know, taught in school 
taught at home and so our kids can see like hey if i can become an afro panamanian chef or an afro-american chef and i can make a living out of this like this is this is what my grandma taught me this is what my mom showed me this is this is what we inherited you know this is ours because if we don't if we don't take ownership of it some people will do you know and they're already trying so it's about ownership and and it's not that our food or our gastronomy is better than the others it's it's about we understanding where it comes from jamaica africa trinidad barbados you know all that connection um some from the caribbean some afro panamanians are in the pacific you know darien and and the island in the pacific too um the afro afro colonials and that's part of our heritage as well and it's it's very beautiful um that people like you francisco and the, the groups that, that we're part of are seeing that and are supporting what we're doing um because in the end it's about visibility you know uh we have to say here we are this is what we do and we want we want to take our place um in the panamanian gastronomy scene just like Sancocho is top, just like Carimagnolas are top, which we love, just like dim sum Chinese breakfast in the morning, it's, it's a thing, you know? Uh, beef patty, plantain tar, one pot, uh, stew peas, you know, that's our thing. And, and they deserve, those things deserve a place in, in, our, in our culture, in Panama City, you know? <laughs> so that's what we do. Thank you very much, Isaac. We're going to come back to you uh, later on in the program. Now I'd like to continue with the uh, doctor, Louisa Martin Humes. Louisa, Dr. Louisa Martin Humes was born in Panama City, Panama. She attended Jose de Ovaldia Elementary School and Jose Dolores Moscote High School. In 1966, she migrated to the United States with her family where she completed her education. Dr. Martin obtained a bachelor's degree in communication <clears throat> disorders in 1974 from Emerson College, a master of science degree in speech pathology in 1966 from Columbia University, and a master's degree in public administration in 1983 from New York University. Louisa Martin Humes learned from a young age about budgeting, money management, saving, and investing. From watching her mother develop and manage various small businesses, <clears throat> her mom would always say, if you make $10, save a dollar. This concept was further amplified later. While one of her professors was lecturing about jobs and professions, this professor told the class, you don't go to college to work for the man. And these important life uh, lessons did not resonate until years later. However, Dr. Martin did remember these valuable nuggets of advice and use them as a foundation to build financial wealth and business success. Dr. Martin officially retired in January 2019 and is currently providing mentorship and consultation to future entrepreneurs in her community. Her focus is on helping others develop their business successfully. Dr. Martin, the floor is yours. Our experience with each other. And thank you for that gracious introduction, um, Francisco. But you know, your vision and your wisdom is what makes everything successful. You know, the vision to see in your mind's eyes and the wisdom to bring it to fruition. That's what makes this so important. So I would like to look at this topic uh, with two players the individual and the entrepreneur. This is a thing, everyone cannot be an entrepreneur. 
everyone cannot own a business because in that case, we will not have anyone to buy something from us, to sell, to provide a service. We all are individual though. And so do you know that the individual and the business person um, have to think of finance and budget the same way? The difference is that the, individual, the business person have a different environment. So the concept of working for the man um, came from my professor. And um, I feel like I, when I listened to that, I thought that maybe if I don't want to work for the man, then I need to work for myself. So the individual has to think about spending, about paying rent, about light bills, about gas, about vacation, you know, and, and the problem is that if this is not done mindfully, if it's not done mindfully, then that person is going to be working paycheck to paycheck. And what do I mean by mindfully? Mindfully means that, uh, uh, for, for example, I was um, mentoring a, a young lady two years ago, and I would ask her to give me your bills and then tell me your monthly um, paycheck. And then she never did that. You have to put your, you have to know what you're making and then you have to know what you're paying out so that you would have a budget to work on. So she, so, and then I looked at her, at her, at her, um, her bills and then she would do something like she would have a dress this, this year for the, uh, Easter and a dress next year for Easter. What about using the same dress that you had the year before, this year? Do you know that Michelle Obama did that and they criticized her how many times she wears the same thing? Well, those are the things that comes in budget, budget and money management. And this is something that Black, black afro panameños Blacks in the diaspora don't think about how do you budget and save at the same time. And, you know, I know that I'm not, I'm not talking to everyone because I know that everyone is not in the same position to save, save, and, and that. But like my mom said, if you make a dollar, you say, if you make $10, you save a dime. So how do you do that? You know that you can pay yourself every time you get paid. You need to pay yourself. And that payment does not go back in the house kitty. That payment, that dollar that you save should go to a savings bank to, um, to make sure that you are able to increase that. That, that does not... Um, fit in you putting that money back in your kitty. In, so, so let me give you real numbers. Let's say that you can save $50 a month. Let's say you can save $50 a month. And, and I mean, you save that by cutting out unnecessary spending. And you can take that $50 and invest it in an institution that is paying 7% interest. If you are 40 years old now, in 35 years, you're going to be 75 years old. You would have saved $90,056. Look, I know that everyone, everybody's circumstances is just not the same. But the fact is, if you budget and you save that, you would, be, you would at age 65 have $90,000. Now... You, put your, you don't put your monies in a local bank when you're thinking about saving. Because when you put your money in a local bank, what happens is when you think you need it to go buy another dress or to go uh, um, shopping, you're going to go to the local bank and, and get that money. So that's not saving an investment. You need to find an institution. Once you have accumulated oh, that oh. wealth from saving that dollar, a month from the $10 that you make, you're going to find an investment firm like Fidelity or Schwab or Lincoln Finances, and you put that money away. 
so that you can see that ninety thousand dollars at the end of your at the beginning of your retirement. So I want to go to the entrepreneur because entrepreneur is a person who has a business mind, who who has a, a vision, who wants to make sure that that vision comes to fruition. But they have to go through that same process. They have to be able to uh, manage their finances and budget and save. I have a few colleagues who think that buying, trading in their car every day, every year for a new car is saving. But when you, are, when you have a business, you have to think of yourself as the man. You are the man that you didn't want to work for. And so you have to. You have to make sure that you, you, you're providing for your later years. So you invest that money, some of that money that you, that you are making, and you say you put it away in an investment firm. I can, I can assure you that if you put that money in an investment firm, you can grow it and become more productive or become more, uh, develop more wealth in your, your later years. So I, I feel like both of them are the same. I feel like you need, to, you need to look at your budget, look at your finances. And again, I'm talking in general because I know that Everybody don't have a dime. Somebody might not have a dime tomorrow to, to get a meal, but you still have to look at that dollar that you got and still take a 10 cents from it or that $10 that you have and take away a dollar from there and save it. We as a, as a group, as a culture, as black folks don't have that mindset. And I'm here tonight to ask you to develop that mindset of whatever you Whatever you have, whatever you make, however you make that money, you need to save something of it. And for the business people that are there, from my experience, that you that you um, make sure that you don't save it on your own. You need a financial manager. You need somebody to help you um, to uh, save and invest that money that you have. So I'm hoping that somebody would be listening listening to me tonight to know that no matter how much money you have, no matter how, how much um, bills or financial um, um, responsibilities you have, there is a way to manage that, paying your, your bills, budgeting and financing and saving. Thank you, Dr. Louisa Humes, appreciate it. Now we'll go on to Bishop Orlean Cummings. Bishop Orlean Cummings, a native of Guyana in South America, is an interdenominational minister, holds a master's degree in public administration and a master of divinity degree. Bishop Cummings is an entrepreneur, motivational speaker, educator, and community advocate. Bishop Cummings is the owner and operator of a preschool program located in a community populated by economically challenged black and brown families. In addition, Bishop Cummings is the founder and president of St. Teresa, St. Teresa's Ministry and Sabbath School, a nonprofit philanthropic organization that provides basic medical supplies, non-perishable food items, clothing, shoes, and school supplies to orphanages and reputable organizations that provide assistance to children. And she also loves sharing the knowledge and experience. She didn't put that in, I did. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, this, ex this esteemed panel. My God, he makes me sound more interesting than I actually am. But um, to uh, Mr. Knight, I really want to thank you for the invitation to be a part of this panel. Um, I feel like I stand to learn more from listening to the, these great speakers um, and folks who are out there doing it. But just to give you just a tiny idea of my philosophy slash theology about finances and Afrocentric folk, I don't care where you are, we have to start with an understanding that as people of color, we've never seen ourselves as 
valuable because we have always been commodity. We have been the thing that has always been sold and um, we've been traded. Our bodies are the thing that is being traded. Our minds have been the thing that's been traded. So I think that to then start to shift the understanding that now we own ourselves and we have agency over our intelligence and our resources, I think it's really required. It's a lot of work that's required. Um, and I love listening to Dr. Martin Hume because you're right there is an understanding that our folks need to be taught from the ground up. So in the ministry work that I do, that's why I have Sabbath school at the end of the ministry. It's not a church, it's a teaching space where I encourage folks to come in, understand your walk of faith, but let's see how that walk of faith can help you build yourself, build your community, build your children and leave a legacy that's not just about leaving our children in debt. You know, unfortunately, you know, generational curses are a thing. You know, so many of our children only inherit diseases and debt, um, and there's very little knowledge that's passed down. So I make it my business that wherever I'm positioned, that we speak about how do we build the self? How do we understand finances as people of color? Because speaking to a Black person about finances is not the same thing as speaking to a white person about finances, because the understanding is very, very different. You have a white community that's born with the understanding that they're entitled and you have black community where we've never seen too many of our brother like Isaac, you know, and I'm so impressed that he is on this page. And I'm telling you the next time I come to Panama, I'm gonna look for you and all that great food that you say you cook, I'm coming. Um, I love Panama. I've, I visited your beautiful country twice. Um, and I do intend to come as soon as this pandemic lifts, I will be knocking on Francesco's door and we're coming to eat and I wanna meet all of you. So. I'm going to reserve further dialogue until we really start the conversation. But again, thank you all. And I'm excited to be part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Cummings. Uh, I, would, um, I would like to go back to um, Isaac and ask a question. Well, first, in what area of the, the city of Panama you grew up, Isaac? Um, I was born in Rio Abajo, in 4th Street, Rio Abajo, um, okay. and I, I was raised in between Panama City and Colón. My family in Colón is from Rainbow City. Okay. Um, okay. So, you know, I, I grew up in between those two parts of Panama. Are you a good dancer? Um, I don't because know. Because they say I... the people from 4th Street are the dancers. <laughs> okay. You talk oh, to Professor. Yeah, talk to Professor Maloney. He'll tell you. Okay. okay. Well, now, okay. Now, um, now it makes sense. <laughs> uh, what or who inspired you to want to own a business or become a businessman? Um, well, I think my family is the main reason uh, uh, for what I became an entrepreneur. My great grandpa was a fisherman. He owned a liquor shop in the uh, um, in the Terra Plain area in the, in the Bay of Panama. And then my grandma, she learned how to cook at a very young age. Uh, and then my dad owned a restaurant when I was growing up, a different restaurant. Okay. So from the time I was 10 year old to, till I was 20, we owned a restaurant. So I spent my, my teenage years in my dad's restaurant basically. So when I turned 23, I started La Tapa and Coco. I'm 31 now. So La Tapa is like nine year old. Wow. And, um, you know, my family, man, it's, it's all about the family in the end, you know? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, in talking about uh, training and education, you know, I spent most of my um, adult life in the city of Boston. And um, I remember, I don't know what drew me to that thought, but um, it had seemed to me that in my country, Panama, our young people going to school weren't being trained to be business people or business managers. They were all trained to just go out and work for someone. And a few years ago, I think it was last year, they had um, on the news on the television and they were talking about education and jobs and so forth. And one of the individuals that was on the panel mentioned that. This is, this is like maybe 30 years later after my thought, 
that I have somebody's mentioning this that our schools in Panama we don't train people, students to get into business management, how to manage money. But the upper echelons, their children get that education because they send them out of the country to study. You know, even in the young times when um, during the 60s and so forth, when many of us were going to public schools in Panama, the politicians and the upper echelons, their children were going to school in the areas at the time that was owned by the United States government, what was called the Canal Zone. That's where their kids went to school. You know, so um, that is one thing I feel that we have to change a lot regarding um, our young people. Uh, one thing that I see now is that young people are getting a lot more involved in uh, the things that we're doing uh, with the different organizations, the black organizations here. We're trying to encourage uh, young the organizations to get young people involved in their organizations because most of the groups are run by older folks and a lot of them never cater to young people so they're starting to do that now you know so that is one thing that um i think that we need to uh focus on <clears throat> excuse me is the education of young people to, to towards ownership and management of uh, businesses and being entrepreneurs and so forth you know i mentioned that word entrepreneur to a few young people and wanted to know what, what was it they had never heard it, you know, so, um, but um, Bishop Cummings, where did the inspiration come from to make, <coughs> excuse me, to make you want to be involved in the things that you do as far as community work? I know that your organization does work throughout the world. Uh, what inspired you to, um, to want to get to, to this point, to the things that you're doing? Um, the inspiration actually came from two places, and that main um, platform of my inspiration was where I was born and raised in Guyana. Um, even though my mom, I would say, was doing relatively well financially, but around us, there was so much poverty. And I remember thinking that the first chance I got when I came to America, the city of gold, that I wouldn't forget the people who are still there, because not everyone gets to make it out. Um, and, and that has always been on my heart. So when I got my education and started the ministry, uh, because I've been in ministry for close to about 25, almost going on 30 years, I can't believe how long I've been there, but I've always felt that the church needs to do more. It's not about saving souls alone when people are hungry. I feel like we as ministers need to go out into the community. We need to have our pulse, our hands on the pulse of the community. And I'm not just talking about the community in the church, it needs to be the community at large. And we need to understand how can we do more? Um, and I feel like coming to someone and try to, um, I'm gonna say, save their souls. And I hate that phrase, while they themselves are struggling, I feel like we're doing a disservice to, to the gospel. So for me, when, I, when the Holy Spirit laid it on my heart to create St. Teresa's ministry, it was intended not to be a pulpit ministry, but to be a ministry that goes out. Uh, we need to know the people and understand how can we do better? How can we help our fellow man? Um, and that help isn't just for those in Newark, New Jersey, where I reside and where the ministry is housed, but abroad, because there are so many people who don't have a voice. And there are so many folks who cannot reach out and ask for help. So for those who can, I feel like we, we have an obligation to do it. So that's part of where the inspiration came from. Um, and the other part of that inspiration, honestly, is I, I'm a retired social work supervisor uh, from social services in New York. So I had a chance to work in the gutters and the trenches and see what's really going on with our black families and see the havoc that's being wreaked on our children and single parents and how harmful, you know, what, what's going on with our economy and how these families are not getting the services that they need. So those, those sources fuel why I have the passion I do for the work that I do. Um, it's about trying to make certain that we reach as many people as possible we can't solve every issue, but if we can link with organizations like Francisco's and others, and I'm hoping those who are on this page hear us and understand that the reach, it, it has to be hand over hand so we can reach people that we may, we may never know. So it's about recognizing that our success isn't for us alone. Our blessings aren't for us alone. It's, for, it's to create a platform for us to reach others and pull them up 
with us because I feel like the black community, that's the one thing that does not happen as often. I feel like when some of us make it, we run and we forget about those who need us to help pull them out of that gutter. Um, and, and I don't wanna be one of those. I wanna make certain that wherever I am, my hand reaches backward to pull people forward. So that's part of my inspiration. Okay. Thank you very much, Bishop. Uh, Dr. Humes, uh, do you feel that Afro-descendants have the same opportunities in the job and financial world, even with uh, proper studies uh, as other races? Your mic is muted. Um, we can't hear you. Unmute your mic. Okay. Oops. You, you muted back again. It's still muted. Just touch it once. Yeah. <laughs> now we got it. I know for sure that the Black community, and from my experience, uh, uh, and the, the Blacks all over the world, in the United States, in Panama, even with the education that we so highly attain, do not have the same, um, the same experience or the same, the same experience that other that others in our community have, and we see that all the time. I see that in my daily in my daily goings and coming. I see where um, um, I work in in public school in, I've worked in the public school and I've, and I have uh, preschools and I've seen where I've helped my teachers and my staff and my, 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 my family, the parents go through school, get education, and they still end up working in McDonald's or Burger King. And no matter how hard they try, it is not there for them. I don't know what is our answer. Our answer maybe is for us to get together as a group of people and help each other. Like that bishop come and say, pull somebody back from, from behind and pull them up with you. But what I noticed also is that the black community don't pull each other up. We don't pull each other up. And that's something that has to begin to happen. We have to, like every other group, learn to give and share with each other. And that's something I don't, we have to get to a point where we can do that. And, and that's the way that we're going to be able to be a part of this world experience, a part of the economy, a part of the political scene, a part, we have to do it ourselves first. And I don't see that yet. Thank you. Um, it is true that uh, as a people, we need to join hands that um but that seemed to be very difficult for us uh as an example for me with uh my organization switching to this uh trying to help people with the diapers and so forth i have my three most um popular donors and supporters on this panel you know, uh, most of what we get, we get from outside. And there's a lot of people in this country and in the community that knows many of us and know what we do and so forth, but they're still not there to help you right. along during these times that you really need help from them. And then you sit with them and they have these long stories to give you of what's needed in the community. But then when you reach out to them, they're not there. You know, so um, that is something that really, really uh, needs to happen. Uh, Mr. Villaverde, as a, as a Afro-descendant, how difficult or easy was it for you to be able to um, get the funds or finance needed uh, to be able to um, establish your business as far as dealing with banks or finance companies and so forth? Um, definitely, it has, it has been a challenge um, in every single stage. I could have kept my business in the informal 
world, you know, not reporting my taxes and paying, you know, all the uh, employee benefits and, and all of that. But at some point I'm like, you know, I, I want to have a, a, a legit, you know, uh, legally constituted uh, in, in enterprise. So I had to make the whole uh, process of, of legalizing all my paperwork and everything. And, you know, my family has contributed with, with some properties like, like my grandpa's house. And, and um, you know, that has, that has been a help in, in what I'm doing. Also, I think the biggest challenge that, that I have faced is not even like the, the cash to do the things because I've been bootstrapping my operations. Like I start with, with this amount of cash and, and instead of taking the profits and, and spending it, what I have been doing for the past four years is reinvesting you know, the profits into the same business. So, so that has been, that's, that's something that has worked uh, for, for me in the, in the business. But the part that has been very difficult is not having uh, people in my family or in my community that, that has done it, you know, the, like that have made it in this, this, cause this is, this is a, a complex world, you know, it's not only that you have to cook well or being a good cook, because we as Afro Panamanians or even as Caribbean people, we are recognized for our flavors, for our spices, for our mixes. You know, we're good cooks. You know, people from Europe come to our island to eat our food. So uh, there's no doubt that we can cook, right? But when it comes to managing a business and, and, and now you have the technology side of it, the social media side of it, it's very complex. So in my family, nobody has done it, you know, like in, in my friends, they haven't done it. So I have had to partner it up and, and connect with people, sometimes white people, sometimes Chinese people, sometimes people, you know, from, from abroad, I have, um, couple of friends in the in the United States that you know are very close and and I can see what's happening up there and then implement down here you know because in the end we are all connected so I will say that cash has not been that big of a problem uh, the biggest challenge I have faced is um, being able to adapt what we do to the current times you know there's no book about that you have to you have to see learn apply execute revise do apply and you know that's that's my point on that uh have you ever had any um situations like with banks where maybe getting a hard time because of um being an afro descendant um I think in Panama, uh, Francisco, more than, than people not giving me a loan because of Af I'm being an Af because I'm an Afro Panamanian or an Afro descendant, I see more uh, the challenge of my family not having enough properties and land. You know, like um, the banks, they need a collateral, and and when you go there, you you need a hundred thousand dollars for your business. Yes, they want to give it to me. But, but when they say, okay, if you don't pay this back, what property can you put in, you know, in, as collateral? And then I'm like, yeah, my family don't own land. We don't own properties. So that's where we struggle. So more than the bank not wanting to give the money, because yeah, in Panama banks wants to give the money, you know? It's uh, we, the Afro-Panamanians, not having land and not owning properties. So that's the challenge, not just for me, but I'm sure for 95% of the people that are trying to, to build the business. So the strategy has been, you know, bootstrap, reinvest, don't make the profit, don't take it, just put it back in the business. And at some point, you know, you're gonna reap the, the benefits. All right, thank you. Um, that stuff about property and, and having collateral, it's amazing because when the uh, <clears throat> when the country was being sheared, 
we were left out, you know, but uh, my uncle who just recently passed used to tell me a story about um, one of our, one of an individual that I know their family and so forth uh, in the real our area. <clears throat> when property was being shared amongst themselves in areas of Rio Bao and Parque de Febre and so forth. Uh, the first uh, commander of the fire department took this gentleman, West Indian, out to this land and told him that as far as he could see, he could have it. All he had to do was fence it off and he'll get it registered. And the answer was, I don't need any land. Okay. And that um, land, if you look at what's called Parque Lefebvre, that community was is owned by the Lefebvre family. Okay. And in time, they decided to start selling smart small uh, parcels of property. And that's how the neighborhood uh, came about. And a lot of the stuff that we thought was gone, which was the property on the main road, we thought that other people owned it. Now we're finding out that they still own it and now they're putting up uh, towers. See, So um, we unfortunately don't um, tend to take advantage sometimes of certain situations. When my great grandmother was coming to Riavajo to purchase a little land to build a house, her husband at the time said to her, he doesn't need any land. But she decided to leave him in Cullen and go to Riavajo and she bought a piece of property on her own in 12th Street, you know. So uh, for some reason, and it seemed to always be the men that were the ones that were saying, I don't need that, you know. So um, that's a mindset that has to be changed. And, and, and another thing is um, you find like a, in America, we're a group of... Uh, uh, businessmen will get together and create some sort of an enterprise, you know, and we don't have that here. And it's hard, to, those that are that are um, running the place and the businesses now, it's hard to knock them out because they've been there so long and they control and their families control so much, you know. But, uh, Yeah, we're going to go to Bishop Orlean. What recommendations do you have for young people that may be interested in business startup or maybe dream of running a large corporation? I, that, oh my God, that, that's such a passion of mine. Um, the first thing I would say to them, I am going to piggyback over something that Dr. Martin said. You have to learn to save. We, our young folks have this instant gratification mindset where if they see a pair of sneakers, I want it and I want it now. Well, let's be honest, it's the parents who started that nonsense because we have this new mindset where in order to keep our children quiet and happy, we just throw things at them. And where we grew up on this side, I don't know the age group of the folks on the side, but I grew up in an era where I had to earn things. My mom didn't just give me something because I was alive. I had to show her through my grades my behavior, that I deserve something. So I think in order for us to start to get young folks into understanding the idea of building, we have to help them to understand that you need to earn something. Nothing is just given to you by virtue of you being alive. You have to have the right attitude. You need to have a good work ethic. You need to be de desiring of more for yourself and realize that, you know what? Sometimes you're gonna just have to go hungry in order to build your empire. You can't have everything right now, right at this time. And the idea that you need to keep up with your friends and keep up with the Joneses, that mentality has to go. Because the Joneses may have or are doing things that you probably don't wanna do because you don't know how they've earned the things that they have. Whereas if you stay in your corner, you remain focused, you humble yourself in terms of your desires and what it is that you need to have, learn how to distinguish the difference between a need and a want. There's a vast difference between the two. You need shoes. You don't need shoes that cost $400. There's a difference. So if we get our young folks to understand that money, your time, your health, and 
all of these things that you have are commodities that must be used wisely. I think that's the way we're going to start to help them to understand it. You know what? In order to have that business, in order to not work for someone and instead work for yourself, own your wealth, own the resources in your community, you need to first start with the understanding that, you know what, you have to recognize what you need right now and what can wait. And again, I'm going back to parents. We have to stop throwing things at our children. So the, the in order for the shift to occur, we got to speak to the adults because some of our adults, we, our, our thinking is really corrupt because why? We've fallen prey to the social media idea of what is wealthy and what is beautiful. So as a result of that, we've forgotten some of our old world teaching because we grew up in a system where you, you, you didn't get everything right away. So I feel like in order for us to start building the new generation of entrepreneurs, we need to help them to think differently. And that is, again, what you have, you must stop and think about how you're using the resources you have. And once they understand what that means, I believe that we're gonna start seeing young people that use, um, that are gonna use their talent to build a community and build up their family, build wealth. Um, I also cannot ignore the power of social media because social media have made young people very, very wealthy, some young folks very, very wealthy. Um, and I want them to understand how can you use that platform to be a source of positive inspiration to your fellow young folks? So yes, we wanna build up entrepreneurs, but again, it all starts with, what do you understand yourself to be in your community? You have to see yourself as a leader. You have to teach by example. You have to learn how to, I'm gonna say, be mindful of how you're using the resources you have. Recognize that some things can wait because when you wait for that instant gratification, the end result is much richer. So again, for me, it's all about changing the mindset of our young folks. Thank you. Uh, Estella, do we have any uh, questions on Facebook? No, we don't, not now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Martin, your advice to young people who are in school and have dreams about the future, including making a lot of money. <laughs> I have to agree with Bishop Cummings that it starts with the parents. And it starts with the parents really um, changing their mindset so that they can transfer that to their children. But also, we have to look at the, the, the school system, see how the school system, what the school system is, is saying to our children, and see how that is being interpreted. I have an, an example of a young lady that uh, the parents had their child in the preschool. And she was in, in junior high school and she would want to have an iPhone, a, the, 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 the latest iPhone, and she wants the latest fashion because the, 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 the children, the, her, her friends in school had those things. And the parents would, give her those things so that she can fit in. And, and so again, we have to start with the parents. What I would say to young, to young, um, to young, young adults who maybe is already on their way to college is to have a dream. You have to have a dream. And when you have a dream, you have to, you have to be able to, you have to want that dream. You have to have a vision and you have to really work hard for that vision. And, and you have to also know that there are gonna be obstacles in the way and know that you don't give up because those obstacles um, can, um, present themselves to you. But they also have to look back. They have to look back and we have to be there for them. We have to be there as mentors, as, as supporters, as advisors. And, and we have to, as a group in our community, I was listening to the young man and um, he actually didn't have a support in his community, in his family. He like had his own push to, to become successful and to create wealth. And, and we have to, as a group, I go back to that song again, we have to, as a group, older, 
uh, um, the elder to be able to look back and grab those young children or young adults that have that dream, that have that vision and pull them up and, and know that it's going to be a struggle because they don't, they want instant gratification. They want instant money. We know it's going to be a struggle and we can't give up because it's going to be a struggle. We have to just sit back, relax, and then come back to them and teach them and show them how to create wealth, how to create a legacy. And, and again, you got to go to that budgeting, management, financial management, savings. That's the way I believe that we have to look at our young, young adults and just just help them to achieve their goals, their potential that they have. Thank you. Uh, there's a question, Dr. Martin, how do you identify your mentorees? You know, I don't identify mentorees. What happens with me, and I've mentored many, and I've seen many acquire their dreams, and I've seen many fall by the wayside. I look at, um, first, people come to me. Young adult comes to me. You know, I've had young adults come, well, how did you do this? How, you, how do you have all these preschool? How do you manage it? And then I would sit down and talk to them. But I also identify from, I, I try to get a challenge. I try to pick out somebody who is possibly have a dream, but don't, or not going the right way. And, and I bring them in and talk to them. Sometimes it lands and sometimes it doesn't. I've had experience where I see somebody struggling. Somebody is struggling with, with um, working, for example. They're just going to work at Chick-fil-A. But I talk to them and then if I hear that there's some hint, hint that they want to go to college or they want to get a better job or they want to get a vocation, then I put myself out there and work with them, talk to them, direct them, find a resource, come back to them. Then you have to actually hold them by their hands. You actually, actually hold them by their hands and don't feel bad about it, that you are holding somebody by their hands that want to do better. Okay, Dr. Martin, a question. Uh... Um, oh, okay, a question for um, Isaac or Isaac. What are the ways you utilize social media in your marketing plan? And um, after um, Isaac answers that question, uh, Bishop Orlean, if you can could um, respond to that one also. Um, we we have been growing our social media outreach uh, for the past three years. We have uh, two people in the team uh, specializing in like focusing on ourselves through Instagram and Facebook basically. Uh, so a lot of our budget of marketing goes into social media. We don't do, we don't do much of like printed uh, marketing like, like in magazines or newspapers. Uh, what we do is digital, um, but in the end, at, at the end of the month, I will say 20% of our sales come, come through social media, Instagram, Facebook, Google. So it's a, it's a, it's a big number when it comes to a restaurant, you know, uh, right after we were shut down by the government lockdown in back in March, we launched the uh, latapamarket.com. So it's a, it was like the evolution of a restaurant, you know? Um, we transformed everything into um, a website, e-commerce, basically, with Shopify. So it's latapamarket.com. And we put our plates and our dishes and our beverages and our desserts, everything up there. And even today that we're open again to the public, uh, we're still making sales every day. 
uh, through our website. And now, and at this point, uh, my restaurant had 12 tables in San Francisco. Now it has been reduced to five tables. So uh, we're still not making enough profit or we're still not making the same revenue that we were making before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's a, there's a good thing about it. Um, I have less labor cost and energy, electricity bill, and I have less bills, you know, because I have less tables, less people, you know, just one shift in, instead of going from 11 in the morning till 10 at night, we just go 11 to eight, which is just one shift. Um, and, mom, and and the plan is that for the next two months, the, the remaining two months of 2020, focusing on off premises products, you know, so trays of food, uh, beverages, things that you can consume at home or in your office. I, like, I'm, I don't want to go back to having my main income coming from the, from the walk-ins. Because if the, if the wave comes again with all the cases of COVID and everything, and we're locked down again, I don't want to have my, my revenue compromised uh, as it, it has been compromised for the past seven months. You know, we are, we're focusing on off premises uh, products, basically. Thank you, Isaac. Go ahead, uh, Bishop Cummings. I, I'm impressed with what I heard from Isaac, and I do agree. I think the main thing with us, especially in this era, you have to be aware of shifting platforms. I didn't realize how important Zoom was going to become in education. I really did not foresee that we would be in a space where you would have preschool online for heaven's sakes. And everything happened like this, like it did. right in front of our eyes. It really, really did. And you know what? We didn't have a chance to breathe or think. But what we had to do was move and move very quickly if we wanted to survive. So I honestly think that the key to using um, social media or any platform, you have to be aware of what's happening in your environment. A lot of people got caught up guard with COVID because you know what? They were living in a bubble. They weren't paying attention to the international news. I don't watch local news. I watch the BBC. I know what's going on in Panama. I watch Panamanian news so I can know what's happening in the United States, which is very interesting. So in order for you to not get caught off guard and understand how times are shifting and how your voice needs to shift and how you reach people, you have to look at what's going on internationally. Um, so that I think it's really imper imperative that as a people, as business owners, entrepreneurs, educators, you cannot do things the way you've always done it. You have to always be looking for a better way to, to market yourself, put yourself out there. Back in the days, it used to be flyers. You gave somebody a piece of paper. That's no longer the case. It's text messaging. It's TikTok. It's videos. It's going live at, at an instant to showcase what you have. Um, and that's just reality because the world has become smaller as a result of social media. And so your page has to be strong. Everything that you do has to have a strong social media presence, but folks even think you're legitimate. So that's, that's the reality. I think that we have to just pay attention to what's happening. And I think in order for us to even be prepared for the quote unquote second wave, you gotta watch international news. Find out what are they doing in Europe? What are they doing in China? What are they doing in Japan? What are the young folks doing? What are the new social media platforms that young folks are creating? And you have to get involved. I don't care how old you are or what your um, product is. You have to uh, acclimate yourself to what young folks are doing because they are going to be the voices that are going to create the new platforms so that the older folks like us can survive. So the key is if you have young people in your life, you want to find out what are they doing? How are they using their devices? What system, TikTok or whatever these new systems are, find out what those things are, ask your young folks how to use it, put yourself on it. You have to rebrand yourself and rebrand the platform. And that's just what it is. It's just the world stage has changed and we're gonna have to look at it through the eyes of young folks and we're gonna have to look at the Orient. Honestly, I, I really think those are some of the, the newest platforms. You gotta look at what's happening internationally and adapt it to your system. So that's what I believe. Thank you very much. We have um, a question for um, oh, for Bishop Cummings. What are the top three things you would recommend an entrepreneur to do to get started? Three things I believe, get a ledger, get a book. I'm gonna take you back old school. 
get an old-fashioned notebook, write down your ideas, write down your vision, because you will never be successful in anything if you have no clear sense of what it is you want to build. So first things first, pen and pencil, that's it, write it down. Even if it sounds stupid, I don't care. Belch all of it onto paper. That's the first thing I want you to do. The second thing I want you to do in order to build yourself, I need you to be real about who you are. Do you possess the skills to build the thing you want to build? And again, write all of that down. Create columns for yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Who do you have in your corner that can bridge the gap between your strengths and your weaknesses so that your vision that you just wrote down can happen? If you realize that you have a deficit in terms of support systems, the next thing I want you to do is start looking outside of your community. Don't just look at your auntie, uncle, grandma, grandpa to help you build because they may not have the resources. We just heard it from Isaac. His family didn't have the land so he can use collateral. So sometimes the next thing you need to do as a budding entrepreneur, you need to form connections. You need to have relationships with folk who can take you to the next level. So what I'm asking you to do is to assess your inner circle. If you're surrounding yourself with folks who are going nowhere, you're not going to be successful in where you need to be. Change your circle. Folks are going to call you up at They're going to think, oh, you've gotten big for your britches. Yes, be big for your britches because you know what? You want to become bigger. So in order for you to be successful, like I said, write it down. Get a notebook, old-fashioned notebook, write things down. And I know you asked for three, but the fourth thing I'm going to tell you to do is shut up. Don't talk about your ideas with folks who cannot help you. Shut your mouth. Keep quiet and talk only to the people who can help you build, who are serious about your future, who want you to succeed. Only talk to them. Don't go running your mouth to your friends. Don't post it on Facebook. You literally just took away your energy that you need to build by talking to folks who can help you. So. Three things, write it down, be clear about your vision, look at your inner circle, and if it's the folks you need to help you are not there, look outside of that circle. Fourth thing, shut up. Don't talk to folks who can't help you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we have a question for uh, Dr. Martin. Will you recommend a person reaching out to someone in our same business field to be a mentor and how do we start that conversation? Here goes one minute. Would you recommend a person reaching out to someone in our same business field to be a mentor? And how do we start that conversation? A mentor can be anyone. A mentor doesn't have to be the person that is in the business that you want to go in. Remember that when you are, when you have a vision and you have, and I tell people this all the time, just because I have preschools or I, uh, or I bake cake, doesn't mean that I can't manage a restaurant. Doesn't mean that I can't um, open a, a, a thrift store. Because it, it comes to managing money, managing people, um, the media, like that, 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 that is discussed. So no, it's not recommending that person in your field or it, um, to that you want to open a business in that field that you have to be a mentor for. A mentor is going to teach you how to budget. A mentor is going to teach you how to look like um, um, Bishop Cummings said, how to look for resources. A mentor is going to teach you how to be disciplined. A mentor is going to teach you how to realize your vision. You can look to anyone who has a business mind, who is serious, who is serious about you, who is serious about your ideas to mentor you and to, to develop that vision that you have that you can create wealth and be, be uh, through riches. Thank you, Dr. Martin. This question is for all three panelists. We'll start with um, Isaac. When you first started your business and you hit a wall, what did you do to keep encouraged and to keep going? 
Um, there has been many walls, my friends, like <laughs> many, you know, some larger than others, some stronger, more difficult than others, but yes. Um, um, my mantra is, is to believe that, you know, our ancestors faced huge challenges. Some some of the challenges that they had to face, we, we can't even picture, imagine, you know, like we can't even grasp the whole context sometimes, you know, and they made it, you know, that's the reason why we, we have the beliefs that we have today, the culture that we have, the heritage that we have. Um, so when I feel like I'm in front of a wall, I'm like, you know what, um, I have African blood going through my beans right now so you know you can you can be strong wall you can be you can be hard you can be all you want but you cannot kill my spirit man the people always talk about how strong physically um afro descendants are like, like yeah black people they can you know like go through pain and all this. yeah yeah we're, we're physically strong yes but like, uh, not a lot is being said about how strong uh, we are spiritually, you know, in our spirit, in our soul, inside. We, we, we're resilient, you know? So I, I look for that and, and I focus on that and I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it and here we are, my friend, you know? That's, that's a mantra. Bishop Cummings? For me, a wall serves two purposes. One, I, there's a story in the Bible about uh, Jericho. And what happened is God sent the priest and the priest blew the trumpet and the wall shifted. So the first thing when I see a wall, I'm blowing the trumpet of praise. So my wall has to shift because what happens is when you come marching, especially if you are confident and you know that you have truly been called, let me tell you something, blow that horn. And it could be a simple thing as thank you, God, for this wall. Because by doing that, what you do is you shift the plates underneath that wall and the earth have to move. And guess what happened to the walls of Jericho? They fell down. So sometimes with, with us in business, ministry, wherever it is, because I feel like the conversation we have isn't just about um, for-profit organizations. It could be for ministry as well. You have to learn how to stand your ground. Don't just run because something bruised your face. That's okay. That's why you have a forehead. Keep knocking. But the main thing is don't give up. Keep shouting those praise. Keep believing in yourself. And I strongly believe in mantras. We create some mantras for yourself where you self-talk yourself through that wall. And I'm telling you, it's going to come down, especially if you are confident, again, in the call in your life, you know what you're supposed to be doing. Shout the praise. The wall has to come down. And that's what's helped me that even when things seem impossible and I, it's not going to move for me, you're not moving me. I'm, you, you, that thing has to move because I'm going to stand my ground and I'm going to do so with praise. Thank you, Dr. Cummings. Dr. Martin? When I do hit that wall or in that wall hits me, I sit quiet. I really, really sit quiet for a minute. And I don't mean literally a minute, I sit quiet. And when I sit quiet, many things run through my mind, in my head. And in those moments is when you can come up with solutions, when you can come up with ideas, when you can shift whatever, you're, what, whatever that negativity is into something positive. And the next thing is my vision. I think of my vision and I, said to myself, I'm gonna die getting this thing done. And so when I get hit that wall, I think of my vision. I think of why the purpose, why am I doing this? And then it gives me that extra strength to say, you know what? Okay, you have a wall, but you, you're gonna find a way because, you're gonna, because you have a vision. You have to be very purposeful, mindful in your vision. And then I pray. I should have said that the first thing, but I do sit and pray and I do exactly what Bishop Cummings said. I thank him. I don't pray about, could you please take this away? Could you please not let this happen? No, I pray and I thank him for what I've had, 
what you've given me, the success that I've had before, I pray. And I include that into um, finding a solution or finding a way to break that wall. And then I look for resources. I kind of just like, you know, turn the page. I look for resources that's going to get me through. I've done it over and over and I've been totally successful. Thank you, Dark. Okay, a question from Facebook to all the panelists. Why your own or our own race does not support our businesses? That's not an easy one. Let's start with um, Isaac. Um, I will have to disagree with that question. Um, not my case, man. Um, I feel supported embrace franchise by my by my people man um at the beginning there were some people you know uh, in our community that didn't like what i was doing it's like this kid's trying to change the tradition he's trying to you know why are you changing the one part why are you changing this this is not how this should be cooked and presented and i'm like you know um listen to me I, i'm not trying to change anything i'm just trying to I give my own interpretation of, of our tradition in, in, in putting, you know, some twist on it just to make it more appealable for the younger generations, but I'm not trying to change anything. And I think uh, that way of seeing it has paid off uh, throughout the years. And, and I'm, I'm very supported by my people. The fact that I can speak English and, and my friends speak English connected La Tapa del Coco to the Afro-Americans that visit Panama. So when they go on Google and, and the Afro-Americans are visiting Panama and they look for black owned restaurant or afro Panama, they, they find us and they come and, you know, like that connection has been very positive. You know, the fact that I, I worked in New York for some time and, and the fact that I've been to DC to work and, and I know, you know, what's, what's going on up there when they come and we talk, it's like, we can connect, you know, it's not just a, it's not just a restaurant where you go and you have jerk chicken. It's a restaurant where the owner can talk to you about Jamaica and Kingston and Mulve and, and, you know, it, it, I, I'm a restaurateur, you know, so in the end, it's about you know, having a, a, a conversation with the people, like what I did with you, Francisco, like, no, we're friends, you know, and we just met, I was cooking at a TV show and we met and you come with your wife uh, more than once per month, you know, because um, it's a community. You've been to our Christmas celebration. You've been to my birthday. You've been to, you know, because you build, you, we're building a community. So, so that's, I'm very supportive and I'm happy for that. Okay, thank you. I must say that um, one of the things that attracted myself and my wife to Isaac's restaurant, although the food was pleasant, I don't know if he remembers, the first time I went there, we were surprised of the service and the attention that we were getting from the people that worked for him. Because that's a problem that I find in Panama that even you could go to a five star restaurant and you do not, they, they drop your plate in the table and you don't see them again unless you call someone, you know, but in his restaurant, the people keep coming back to find out if you're okay and if they can help you. And, and if one meal came before the other, they, they bring you something to drink because this is on the, on the, on the house because so that special service caught my attention because aside from my profession for years I worked in customer service so that became a thing that's very very important to me that I complain about a lot so when I when we walked out of that restaurant that evening he was outside and he said to me how was the food and I said to him the food was good but that's not what was important to me what was important was the service that I got in your restaurant and that's what made me go back and go back so many times that, you know, we became a little closer and then we started to do a few things together, you know, so that customer service also made a big, big, big difference. 
I, and and sorry sorry for for talking again. No, um, that's fine. You know what we're doing is a cultural um, education. We're educating the the people. You know our clients. You don't have to explain a pepperoni pizza. You don't. You don't have to explain a lasagna. You don't have to explain a gyro. You don't have to explain a Chinese fried rice. We all know how it is. But like somehow I feel the, the responsibility uh, to explain and to be there to explain to our, to our clients our food. Because we're educating the, the population. They don't know our flavors. They don't know what a plantain tart is. They don't know why it is, why it is red inside. They don't know what a sauce, pick, pickle pig feet. You know, they don't know it. So we have to explain it and give it, give it the importance it has. Pizza has been explained for 300 years, you know? So people understand pizza. Pizza is like, like world, it's a world language. You can order a pizza anywhere in the world. The goal is that one day our food, it's like that too. You know what I mean? Okay, go ahead, uh, Bishop Cummings. Why? What is it? Um, so, uh, okay. Why your our own race does not support our businesses? Okay, I, I'm I'm gonna go a little bit different to Isaac and say that. Let's be honest. In some of our establishments, professionalism is lacking. Um, we as a people believe that because you're serving other black people, you don't have to give them class. But as soon as somebody white walk in, all of a sudden you have some sense. I am a firm believer that the fact that I'm dealing with my own kind, I ought to step it up 10 notches. In my daycare, I, I'm in Newark and I'm not in an affluent area at all. I'm not ashamed to say that. It's an extremely impoverished section of Newark. But I can tell you something, you walk into my daycare, you think you're in, in, in some white part of New Jersey because I'm always professional. My staff is professional. The place is pleasant. We treat people with respect. As soon as you walk into my establishment, you know that you are welcomed. You know that I appreciate your business and I want you to come back. Um, and because of that approach, I've never had to advertise because that behavior and the people I employ, it spreads abroad. So when people come to Newark, they say, I can't believe something like this is here which speaks volume to what else is going on outside. So if I'm in ministry or wherever I go, I make certain that I present the best possible approach to anything because for me, I brand myself. Everything I present to you have to have my mark on it. And that mark will always be professionalism. So wherever, I don't care who you are. I think that as black businesses, sometimes we suffer in terms of lack of support is because we don't put the best foot forward. Our establishments, it may not be fancy, but it can be clean. You can hire people and train them. You don't have to speak the king's English, but have some manners. You know, someone walks into your place of business, good afternoon, good morning, how are you? Treat people as if you care about their business. And I think that we're gonna see a lot better in terms of support from our own community. Um, because again, we shouldn't always reserve the best of ourselves for outsiders. We should present the best of who we are for our own kind. And I think that we're gonna see a lot more support when we are willing to show our people that we care about them and about their business. Thank you, Bishop Cummings. Dr. Humes, you're up. Yes, I agree with Bishop Cummings again. Um, and we pa I possibly am agreeing with a lot of stuff that she says because I, I also have preschool preschools. So I, um, one of the things that really irks me a lot about my people um, supporting me is that, I mean, well, two things. They want more from you than they get from someplace else. And, and no matter what you do, you can be, you know, the most, you, 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 you provide the best quality service. They always want more. They always fussing or, 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 or quejándose por otra cosa. And they don't want to pay extra. And they don't want to pay. That's the, the next thing is that they also want you to give them a break. 
They will go down the street to Baptist um, preschool and pay the, the price of Baptist preschool. But when they come to First Steps Prep, they want you to, well, can you please, can you this, can That's what they do. And they don't do that with the other preschools or with the other businesses. I don't know how it is in the restaurant business, but in the preschool business, those are the things that we fight with all the time until you say, I am providing the same quality service or even better service. So you either, you have to choose. You have to choose, you go over to that service or you stay with me. And you have to stand your ground because, because you have a vision, because you know that you're providing better than your competitors because you know that your staff is qualified because you train them, you providing that service for them through staff that you've trained. And, 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 and let me tell you, they know that my staff know what I want, because if you, if you, if you, if you can't do what I want, you're not going to be there. But those are the two things that we find in the black community, I, as at least in the black preschools with, with, um, them supporting us until they get, you get to the point where they said, you know, yes, I understand. This is better. My, my kid is learning, my kid is reading, my whatever, and then they will stay. But we need to stop that mindset. We need to let them understand that we are black, we are business people, we're providing the same quality care, provide the same kind of respect, the same kind of, um, um, money, um, tuition or whatever you, you're charging as if you were over here in Baptist preschool. Thank you. We're going to, um, we're about 20 minutes or so left. So, um, before we get into our closing commentaries, uh, I think it's, uh, Dr. Humes had mentioned many times about, uh, vision and missions and so forth and in establishing a business or organization or whatever it might be those are two of the most important things that you have to have a mission that you're going to work with that plan of working and you have to have a vision for where it's going to be in the future because if you don't have that then you're not going to get anywhere you know, so those are two things that are very, very important. And um, recently, um, well, I am actually finishing up a class about running um, organizations, uh, which can apply to just about every, anything. And um, most times, especially if you get into the situation where you have to present your organization, um, one of the things that uh, the person given the class is trying to show is that you don't need a long ceremony when you present yourself. And sometimes you look at people's vision and their missions and it's very, very long and you, you spend a good while reading it. So he has taught us to, to compact all your information in 30 words or less. And if you can do it in 25, it's fantastic. You know, but the thing is to um, get that information where the person that's paying that, that you're trying to attract or get their attention, that they are not going to be bored with what you're trying to present to them on paper, you know, and even in your in your um, in your presentation uh, vocally in person. Um, I, I, we had to put a project together and. The project, if I had to read the whole project, it would have probably taken me maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. And he gave us five minutes to present our project. So when I looked at mine, I picked out everything that I thought was very important to um, thing. And I, I presented it to him and in less than five minutes, it was on, I presented it and it was understood exactly what our plan and information was what our budget, how much it was going to cost, you know? So the thing is also in trying to get into business or being an entrepreneur or whatever, when you present yourself to people that you have to meet, that you're trying to get their attention, you're trying to get their money, their help, whatever, don't spend a lot of time where those people are going to be bored 
and wish that you leave the office. You know, get your get your message across as quick as quick as possible. You know, so um, Isaac, if you can give us some uh, closing words, uh, I'll give you about maybe three four minutes. Sure, my friend. I'm honored to share the panel with these brilliant Afro descendant minds. You know, um, I don't know much about their background, but I will. I'm interested now as well in knowing more of what they're doing in the different fields. Um, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Francisco. Thank you. You've been doing some great work. I follow you. What you do in social media, and I think it's it's quite interesting. And, um, you know, basically encouraging the viewers and the listeners to continue supporting the community. I think there's a lot still to be done. Like, it, we still have a lot of work in terms of education, in terms of information and with our community. So, but I think we, you know, there's people doing what they have to do and, and maybe it will take another 50 years uh, maybe another 60 years uh, for us to see some, you know, like see a black president in Panama, you know, for example. And, but we'll get there, my friend. So thanks a lot. And and here I am, you know, Panama City. Okay, Bishop Humes. I mean, Bishop, Dr. Dr. Humes, I just promoted you. <laughs> Your mic, your mic, your mic. I, I, I thank you again for um, inviting me to be a part of this panel. And um, I want to say that, you know, you are one of the person with a brilliant mind. I, I know you don't, you don't, no te halagas, but um, in Boston, he did some fantastic work in Boston with the Panamanian community. He tied that community to the Latin community. And, um, and, and, and now that he's gone, it's like it's lost. That's how important his, his um, presence was in Boston. And that's where I got to meet him. And, I, and, then, and then he goes to Panama and he continued. He has that that drive that uh, um, why not bunny thing that just keep him going. His vision, his, his, his vision, his, his mind's eyes is always open to so many um, cultural things. And, and, and I know he hits that wall a lot. He hits that wall a lot, but he reinvented himself. I was talking to his wife today and I said, you know, he knows how to reinvent himself so that um, he can, his vision can be realized. And that's what I, I'm getting, I got from him. Now for me, I, um, I think that what I would like to see is us, the, the elders really come out there somehow, people with business skills, people who have retired, Black people with business skills who have retired, in, it doesn't have to be like like um, Bishop Cummins said for profit. It could be in any business to reach out and 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 help mentor these young um, adults. Um, mentor um, Mr. Isaac. You know, I, I mean, you know, he probably might think that he knows everything, but he doesn't. <laughs> and we're here, and we can give him a, we can give him some. A thing or two of our experience that will keep him going and make him successful and make him wealthy. And I think that more, I of, us should, <laughs> more of us should go out there and do that. That's my that's my next goal in life is to help as many young black entrepreneur, business minded, don't have to be business men who wants to be in, in corporate to help them and guide them to show them that. You know, we need to step it up. We need to get in that pie that is out there as part of the world. So that's my um, that's my goal and that's my vision and that's what I'm thinking right now. Thank you, <laughs> Bishop Cummings. Your turn. The one thing I want to say to our uh, those listening to us is always remember that your uniqueness is your greatest commodity. 
Don't ever dilute yourself or dilute your style or your presence or your gifts in order to fit in because you figure that's the thing that's going to make you successful. Be you. You are the only person who sees that vision through your eyes. You are the only person who cook that food your style. Don't try to copy anybody. And I feel like sometimes we lose ourselves when we try to dilute ourselves so we can fit in. Be yourself. If God has given you a particular vision to grow a particular business a particular way, stick to it. You may not get all the support in the beginning, but I guarantee you, if you stick to your particular style, you're going to attract a niche of people who like you just the way you are, who want you to cook the food just the way you cook the food. And I feel like, especially for us as Black, as black folks or folks in the Caribbean, um, in South American diaspora, sometimes we get caught up in this idea that I want to be more like Europeans or I want to make myself more whitey in order to be okay. Don't do that. Be yourself. Your uniqueness is what will push you to greatness. So that's what I want to encourage folks to be. Be yourself. That's the best person you can be. I'm just going to have one more thing. Uh -huh. Right. I, um, I have two daughters and I inculcated in them about working for the man. And for years, one of my daughters will always say, me, mommy, I want to work for the man. And she went to, she, um, they, one of them have a doctorate in organization of leadership and one of them have a master's in school guidance and counseling. And, but I instill in them that you cannot create wealth working for the men. I'm sorry, you cannot. You cannot create wealth working for the men. You can you can live nice, you can, you know, buy a house, you can get a car, but you cannot create wealth working for the men. And it's not until three years ago that my daughter met this wonderful man and had a vision like we do. And they got married and she is learning now that she's creating wealth because they have a business and the business is doing fantastic. But you know what happened with that? She is drawing from the, the experience growing up with us in a business, in, with a mindset of a business, with a mindset of budgeting, with a mindset of financing. And so she's able to give to that business experience that he would have gotten anywhere or he would have to pay so much to get. And my other daughter now, she has a business. She has a baking business. She loves baking. And she started out just baking one thing. And now like it, 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 it's called Sweet Retreat and the Sweet Retreats. And she is just doing fantastic. And I, I'm trying to get her to go get, make that leap, make that leap of faith. She still works for the man, but she's still not ready to make that leap of faith to be on her own. But the, 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 my, the other daughter, they have an a, a ambulance business. So when I say that it doesn't matter who you mentor, Candice has a, a sweet retreat business, Kalila has an ambulance business, but I still mentor them about budgeting, investing, and finance. Thank you. Well, there's a message from Candice that says, and one of them have been an entrepreneur since middle school. <laughs> okay, I would like to thank the three of you for being a part of my sharing this information on social media. Um, I am really, really happy that it uh, came into fruition and seemed like um, it was enjoyed by those who participated. Uh, just to let you know, on December 18th, <clears throat> there is another one coming forth. And that one, um, Richard Honeywell is going to participate. And Bishop Orlean Cummings is going to participate. And that one has to do with African in the Bible. So we're going to church and history and we're <laughs> going back to our African roots. So um, that was something actually that was thought about by Richard Honeywell, Pastor Richard Honeywell, after I did the second um, meetup and talk. 
but then COVID came about and, you know, it, it went by the wayside. But I was searching through my um, WhatsApp messages on, on his page the other day and I saw it and I remembered. So I mentioned to him, I said, are you still interested in doing this? And he said, okay. And I told him, I said, well, we're, we're going to put it together and um, I'll let you know the date. So I spoke to him and I spoke to uh, Bishop uh, Cummings and she agreed. She was all excited about it. But I think she's excited about anything that she thinks is good. Because anytime I talk to her, she sounds like we don't even have COVID, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Isaac, thank you very, very much. I hope that um, we could get together in this coming year and put that program back together uh, with the organization that I just put together. You know, and because um, I think that's a great thing. Normally, we 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 award people with big parties and big functions, and you know, and and, and give them sometimes certificates that they might throw in a draw. But I think this is a new thing that um, he came up with as far as having these. Uh, that was his way of contributing to the community. You know, you go to his restaurant. These people go to his restaurant, and they have a, a very nice meal. And he explains each dish, how it's made and so forth, which I think is very, um, very, very nice, you know. And um, I think it's like, it's a different passage to honoring people you know, to what we're used to, you know. So um, I thank him very, very much for that. Louisa, you know, I love you and Craig very much. And um, we'll always, be on the phone every few days as usual mm -hmm. uh, so um, um thank you guys for uh for being on board and um hopefully we will see you on the next one yes i definitely <laughs> will be there okay we have um uh, we have about two minutes or so if um if somebody wants to oh um bishop cummings could you um, tell us in a couple of minutes about the work you do internationally as nonprofit? Okay. Because I think you mentioned to me that um, like four or five countries where you have uh, people that deal in nonprofit and sharing throughout the world. I do. Um, St. Teresa's ministry was actually formed back in 2016. Um, and the vision that God gave me was to find orphanages and not send things, but go there. So I work primarily with orphanages um, and facilities that house the poor. And what I do is I contact people on the ground before I go there because I want to make certain one I'm safe um, and to define what is their need. And then what they request from us is what we bring to them. Um, and why that is unique is because we're not just handing things and walking away from people as if they're leprous. We actually go to the facilities, we dine with them, we speak with them, we pray with them. Um, and we make certain that these folks know that their, their life means something to someone. Um, and that's what we do. So a lot of the items that we, we take are items that either my board members and I, we purchase out of our own pockets or things that people donate to us. Um, and we make certain that nothing we send is something that we would never use. We wash those items, make certain that it is presentable because to me, not because someone is poor means that they should get trash. So again, that goes back again to what I was talking about, my stamp um, in terms of the quality of things. So that's pretty much what I do. Uh, so far, God has blessed us to do some work in about 11 different countries. Um, and that continues to grow. We were in Panama twice, honestly. So I was in Cologne, so I'm familiar with those areas. Uh, we did some work out in the Philippines, uh, Guyana. So we're, we're, we're in a lot of different spaces. Um, and I'm really excited about where God is taking this ministry and where else we're going to go. Because like I said, we just don't send things. We actually take those items. So people get to see our faces and they get to hear our voices. And we do a lot of, we, we've done a lot of work in Haiti. Love that, that place. I just love Haiti. So um, between Haiti and Panama, I'm, you guys are my babies. So um, I, I'm excited. I am excited about the call in my life and the ministry work that we're doing. Okay, well, thank you very much and God bless the work that you do. Well, like thank I you. said earlier, uh, Bishop Orlean Cummings and her ministry, uh, Dr. Louisa Humes and Archbishop Estella Knights, 
those are my international donors, which I have shared. I have shared with um, when we have our our classes. Um, I talk about uh, you folks a lot because I I I like them to know that um, although there's not a major support here, there is people that are support. We reached out and got support internationally. So the drive that we presented with the diapers and so forth, it's, um, you know, it's, it's still going. And um, like I was telling them recently, and I think I spoke to Louisa about this, um, we started this, the organization was started to bring forth black history to young people and people in general in the country not just Panamanian black history, but world black history. And as we began to get organized, the pandemic came about. So we were shut down and that couldn't get going. And through another friend that distributes through another organization, she distributes uh, me, uh, food, food bags. Um, the information was given to me that as she distributes these food bags, She's finding that there's a lot of uh, young women with babies and adults that need diapers. So that's how I shifted to the diapers in about May. You know, and like most of you received the little, little thing that I sent out that we have distributed over 8,300 uh, diapers in the last four months, you know. So um, then my intention was to continue it at least until December. But now we're realizing that there's a need beyond that because some of these people, even if the pandemic was to be finished tomorrow, they're still living in lives that are vulnerable. You know, they have major needs. So they're still not gonna be getting the stuff that they need, even though the country might open up and everybody goes back to work, they're still in the same situation. You know, one one young lady that um, that I donated to um, I think she's about 24, 26 years old, maybe. She has a kid that uh, needed diapers. And then we found out that she can't read or write, you know. And because as I was receiving the texts and texting back, I thought I was texting her. So when I gave her the information of how to get to my area on the train, the person responded and says, oh, no, she can't go on the train because she can't read or write. So she wouldn't know to read what station she's supposed to get off at. You know, so these are the type of people that we're meeting that still needs help, even when the pandemic is gone. You know, because now um, somebody or some organization has have spread the information so that hopefully some organization that's dealing in that part can help and maybe get some education, you know, needs to her because um how is she going to deal with her kids in the future how is she going to go shopping and, and grocery shopping you know so um there's a major need for her beyond just the fact that she needs some pampers you know so um we are um, we realize that the, the the drive is most likely going to continue beyond um the pandemic it might not be as major but there were still going to be people there that we're going to need to help in some format but my hope is to be able to get back to what we originally started to do, which is um, the, the historical stuff, you know. And then there are a few people that came on board that has other projects in mind that we might work on, some related to the environment and so forth. You know, so um, I'll be bothering you folks a lot. <laughs> okay, but I do appreciate your uh, your time and uh, thank you very much and we're going to um estella yes sir there you are i thought you fell asleep <laughs> on me I no thought... i'm here listening <laughs> this is good this next is good. time i go put you on the panel no <laughs> but, uh... I like <laughs> but um i do i do um i do thank the three of you very very much for uh, being a part. And I thank the three ladies for your total support to my organization and the drive on the things that we do because without you, um, we would have nothing, you know. So thank you. God bless 
each and every one of you, keep you strong, keep you healthy, uh, keep you with that drive to continue the work that you're doing. Louisa, with that drive to your retirement, finally. Mm. Uh, so um, thank you again. And uh, Mr. Villaverde, I know we will be seeing each other. My wife don't want to leave the house, so I don't know when, you know. <laughs> but, but we'll be seeing each other in one of those restaurants. I got to take her out far away from here for a while. So um, we will be totally in contact. So um, thanks all, thanks to all of those that joined us on Facebook. We really appreciate it. Look forward to meeting you on the next Let's Meet Up and Talk number four, which will be the history of Afro descendants in the Bible. So Africa and the relationship in the Bible. So I'll ask my sister Estella to close us in prayer and um, until we meet again. All right. I just want to say before I go into prayer, I want to thank each and every one of you. This was great information given today. I was looking at the Facebook and some of the people are there, they are either, you know, around my age or a little younger and, and they were saying the same thing. So this is the kind of forum that we need. I thank you for taking the time to be a part of this because, especially for our young ones, because they need this information, you know? And I, I want to thank my brother for yeah. the work that he's doing. I mean, <laughs> like you said, um, Lisa, he has been working for the Panamanian community from in the United States. Mm -hmm. And he went to Panama and retired. I thought that he went to rest, but Obviously, there is no rest, right? Alicia, th Alicia thought so also. <laughs> she was, she was talking to Luisa about that she today. She was talking to me today about that. <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised if one day I get a call or email or something saying that this gentleman is some part of the government because the way he's moving, I can't understand. But, you know, to God be the glory. And I just want to say, brother, you continue to do what you are doing because you are doing an amazing, amazing job. And, you know, this is what is about helping one another. Yes. Whatever way we can. I thank God for Bishop Cummings, who, I mean, just came on like, like she, I don't know, like <clears throat> just knew you were needed and you just made the call and I just made the contact with both of you and thank God it worked. Look at all what's happening right now. We can get more information on how to move in business and how to move in finances. So I thank God for you. Oh, and Mr. Isaac, mm. this young man, I say may the Lord continue to bless you and just pour a overflowing blessing upon you because of the wisdom and how you are moving. I, you know, in my time when I was young in Panama, this I never saw. It's so true. now to see a young man like this, talking the way he's talking about business, listen, you can definitely be a good example for these younger folks that they can do it. So just stay focused and continue to do the work. Stay in line though. You know, you know if, I, if I um, can take a minute, um, Isaac was talking about the meals that he creates and mm -hmm. how people were um, complaining that he's changing um, the style of what the recipes used to be. And it's no lie because um, some of those restaurants in the real area there in the park, <clears throat> they're, they're, they were complaining about how he, what he does with the food. Mm -hmm. And I try to explain to them that not only about him being young, but the area that his restaurant is in. He's catering to, although a lot of black folks go there, he's catering to a different type of people in a different area. Mm -hmm. So he has to, he can't present the same old rice and peas every day like these people are doing with the little kioscos or whatever mm -hmm. in Real Val. You know, you have to present a total type, different type of meal to these people that is going to attract them 
Right. And get their attention and bring them back to your restaurant in another time, you know. So he, he did go through a lot with that, with um, especially the old timers feel that he wasn't um, doing the um, doing the, the, the cooking and the recipes in the proper way, you know. In fact, one one um, one owner decided that he was going to have uh, a get together to show how it's supposed to be done. And it's not that Isaac doesn't know, but he cannot present those same types of meals um, in the place that he has, you know. So I understood, and we, we have been there many times, and the meals are great, you know. And, and um, the, the, you, you just get that little extra, of the little decoration and that type of stuff that you're not going to get in the old mom and pop restaurant when you go there. They're just going to give you a plate with some rice and a piece of fish, you know, and some planting, you know. So it's a different environment. And um, it's a place that I appreciate plus we do not have, as far as black restaurants, we do not have a lot of restaurants that are of the type that he has, you know, where I would take my wife there for an anniversary, you know, I would go there for a birthday party. You see what I'm saying? So it's a total different ambience as far as the restaurant that he has and provides to the community than what we're used to in the everyday if you just want to go out and get a meal you know so um that's one of the things that i appreciate and and right now he doesn't have a lot of competition because there's not a lot of restaurants like that that well, at least that i know your, tell yeah. your wife that we're working on an open space <laughs> she's listening she's listening okay. <laughs> we're working on a terrace with a roof and everything <laughs> okay <laughs> you know? okay all right buddy we, we, we'll be there don't worry we, but we, i gotta we, um, we do the opening party for the for the open area okay yeah <laughs> all right there you go we'll do that you know but again thanks to all of you um thanks for the help that you give and um Isaac, thanks for um, what you do, and we'll get together and get that stuff going again because I think it's a great thing, you know. And um, again, uh, Bishop Cummings, it's a pleasure to meet you and see you almost live, you know. <laughs> But um, and God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Estella. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus. We give you thanks and praise. We thank you, Father God, for the success and for the information given here tonight. Continue, Lord God, to keep our mind focused on what you want us to present to your people. Father God, this evening, we thank you for each panelist. May you continue, Lord, to uphold them. Lord God, we know that at times things will get rough, but we just want to thank you because you are able to make things possible as long as we stay focused. We thank you for the audience, the, those that were on Zoom and those on Facebook. May you also bless them mightily. And I pray this information will also work in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good night. Thank you, Bishop Estella. 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 Oh. You, know how, Estella, you know how to do a screen snapshot? <laughs>